Welcome back to the Humans of Education podcast, part of the Advocate in Education podcast network. And this week, we're sharing another Humans of Education episode from our other platform. And we want to get all of these on the same platform so that you can go back and listen to them. And some of these episodes are just powerful like this one. And I want to share them again on our YouTube channel and on our podcast channel as well. And this episode is with none other than Mike and Nita Creekmore, the power couple of education who are making waves and doing amazing work, whether that's through counseling with Mike or Nita in her coaching. And if you aren't following these two powerful, inspirational educators, you need to. Their passion for education, each other, and parenting really shines through in the episode. And it was amazing to connect with them last year. And I'm excited to share this episode again. As always, the Humans of Education and our Advocate Podcast are brought to you by our Advocate Partner Schools, where we work with them to provide social, emotional, mental health content and check-ins every single day for their students and for their staff. If you want to learn more, check out the show notes. But besides that, it's enough for me. Enjoy the show. Welcome back to the show. We're excited that you're listening tonight. We've got our first dynamic duo, a couple on the show. I'm excited about it. We've got Michael and Nita Creekmore from Georgia on the show. Guys, welcome to the show. Uh, well, thank you for having us, man. I appreciate it, Nick. Yeah, thanks for having us. We're excited. Yeah, I've been following you guys on social media. I see tons of great content going out. So it's excited to dive a little bit deeper, learn more about you and hopefully help you share your message with our community um, and just kind of get that word out there. I think the more exposure everyone has on different levels, the better. So it's going to be, I hope it's going to be awesome. Yeah. So, yes. So I want to dive right in. You guys are obviously married and parents of four. Tell me what it means to each of you during these crazy times with so much going on in the world. What does it mean to each of you? And Michael, we'll start with you to have that partner in not only the education space, but at home during COVID and the elections today. We're recording on election day. What does it mean to have a partner in Nita every single day along this journey with you? It's, it's an incredible blessing. Um, I look back and I think, man, God, I, I've done something right and you bless me. Um, so I, <laughs> I definitely appreciate it um, because I feel like I'm never by myself. I'm never alone. And it's mm. it's such a relief, especially during times of COVID, during times of because we're both parent educators. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like our jobs never stop. Yeah. So when right. we come home, um, it, we never, we leave, we leave one classroom to enter another proverbial classroom. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so it never stops. So for me, it's just, it means the world to me. I always tell her, babe, I, I don't know, you know, if, if God forbid anything happened, I might as well go along with you because <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to be able to do it by myself. <laughs> right. <laughs> that, that's, that's so great. And I, Nita, I gave you the the easy part. You got to hear his answer. So now you can just yeah. flow off of that. What about Thank what you so you? much for that? I'm so glad <laughs> that was going to go in a whole different direction. Um, <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Um, you know, it's so funny. Me and Mike talked about this the other day because um, right now our schools are um, face to face and we have digital. But the mm-hmm. as educators, we have to go in into our spaces. Um, and I said during COVID, like when we had this like shelter in place. I was like, it would really suck if we hated each other. Like, could you imagine if we hated each other? Like you're just stuck in the house, but you know, we um, were friends first and it was, it was, it wasn't bad. It was like, it was, it wasn't bad. The part that was bad is like hard for the kids because we have four children, um, 16, 14, 13, and six. And they're just, (laughs) they were so active and we were so on the go, um, like literally on the go that it was like, our world just stopped. And so it was kind of like a shock factor for them. It actually stopped right in the middle of, um, no, right after club season, right? No, it was still still, Yeah, in the middle of club volleyball season. They were still doing volleyball, just everything just 
cut off. Right. And so I think um, that was probably the hardest part was just parenting and then also working at home, trying to get them, you know, with crisis schooling at home, yes. you know, it was, that part was, um, was challenging, I think, as a parent. Um, yeah. And then also working at home. I, yeah. I am not a parent myself. I've got, I've got a 130 pound mastiff puppy that I, I feel challenged enough having a dog. Um, wow, yes. but, but, we got one we uh, oh yeah, yeah, it'll change your life. It'll change your life. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so having four children at home, they're super active. You guys are obviously very active in your own schools and your children's lives. What, what daily or weekly practices have you added since that started and now continue as right. you're going to school, but I assume the children are at home during the day. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So what practices, I want, I got two parts to this question. The first one, what do you do as a family, the whole unit that kind of keeps that excitement and support for one another and activity? Is there something that you guys have started doing that's new or different that has you know, just kind of set you guys up for success. <laughs> you want me to talk? You want me to say? You so, okay. <laughs> we are so random. And so. Very, very. And so we were at the table, like literally this is the type of stuff we do. We were at the table the other day and I said, like, we're eating. One thing we do, we eat lunch, we eat breakfast, especially on the weekends. We eat breakfast together. Um, we try to eat dinner together every night. Um, unless they have some kids have work because work is crazy. Their school work is yeah, on steroids right now. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, we try to eat, eat together. Right. So we're at the table and I say, I bet you I can hold a water bottle longer than y'all. Right. Just like straight out, out. Yeah. like straight out <laughs> yeah. full water bottle. Who can hold it the longest? We're literally at the table. Our, we probably still had food, food on our plates. Yeah, and no, I kept eating. I, I, you know, I used my left hand. I wanted, yeah. to, I wanted to give it an equal playing field. So I used my left hand instead of my right hand. So everyone did that <laughs> and it was hilarious. And so like literally, I know I lost, but like people were like literally screaming out because they're like, uh, our kids are like holding it Trying. out, screaming because yeah. yeah. they're because yeah. it's like five minutes in. I mean, we're, we just do it. Arms were shaking. Yeah. Sweat was forming over the lips. Like, it was very intense. It, it was, was intense. And then I, I like, it. I'm calling out to Mike, you can't let the kids win. You know, like, <laughs> you gotta go. And so those are the type of things that, like, literally yeah. we do as a family. Like, we'll watch movies together randomly. We'll make our son who wants to stay close up in the room. Like, he's 16. Yeah. He's 16 yeah. And we'll, and like, everything's well, corny that we do. Where, except for... He, he actually liked the witches. We he just liked, wa yeah, we just watched the witches the new, on HBO Max. We watched it; that was good. That was and he good. he actually sat there and watched it. But you know, it's yeah. one of those things we have to pull him out, and then once yeah. he's there, he, everything's good. Yeah. Um, but those are the type of things that we we've, we've had to do to keep him like entertained. Um, and it's as, it's also been a blessing because it's forcing us to like really just hear the quiet and really be yep. together as a family. Right. Um, and yeah, I think so that's a. Sorry, I don't want to interrupt, but I no, think that ahead. that is a, a high point that maybe we overlooked prior to yeah. this experience, right? Kind of slowing, it's forced us to slow down for better right. or worse. There are positive and negatives, but it's forced us to slow down and like, yep. hey, let's let's sit at the table together and let's watch this show together and let's have these conversations. Let's do silly things together. Like that's such a powerful thing that you know you can overlook when there's so many things right. going on. Like you were talking about volleyball practice and school and homework and like all these little things. Yep. I think it's a it's a beautiful thing that's come of this experience. Right. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. The second part of that question is what have you two done as a couple? If we have educators listening, many obviously don't have a partner that's in education, perhaps, what have you two done as a couple that has also brought you closer or just been different to kind of maintain that connection? I know there's a lot of talk of the stress on our relationship from being around each other yeah. so much. So what do you guys do in, for each other and fun and that kind of stuff? Well, for, for me, it was, I've been, it's been like, what, six, seven, no, now eight, eight months mm -hmm. since I've gone into a gym. Um, and that's been very difficult for me. So I've had yeah. to get very creative with workouts. Um, Nike, the Nike training app is like my favorite app. Hers is Peloton. Yeah. Um, but we both have incorporated waking up at the butt crack of dawn 
at about what 5 15 5 30 mm -hmm. 30 to work out together like that's awesome. something we weren't doing before because we were doing that you know we were able to do it like after we got off of work we would be able to go to the gym you know do about 30 minutes to an hour mm -hmm. so now switching that around that's one of the things that we definitely have done um since mm -hmm. the since COVID mm -hmm. um another thing is I call it the um I'm trying to think of what I referred to it as before when someone asked me um it wasn't the was it the drive-in no it was like a drive-in date night or whatever yeah it, <laughs> what we do is we'll go to um we'll pick a spot um and we're due for one coming up shortly we are um, <laughs> we'll we are. Just, yeah it'll just be the two of us and we'll drive up we'll call it in um pick it up and we'll have a date in the car like date dinner date in the truck like we'll have a date dinner like right there um <laughs> <laughs> right in the vehicle <laughs> in the parking lot of papados <laughs> yeah. yeah so we were right there it's like okay all right and yeah. you know we make it it's it's a date and we just talk uh, yeah right it's, just, it's a nice break i mean we make sure the kids are fed of course we're not we're not going out eating papados and they're not eating. yeah <laughs> so they eat something we get them pizza yeah we get them like something that. yeah something they would want then we go get right. something and we, that we want and then we leave <laughs> yeah, i love it and we go. yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's that's such a good practice to get away and have that time for yourself. Obviously, with you guys being surrounded by young people at school and then obviously having your own continuing school, like you mentioned, at home, getting away and having that adult one-on-one -on -one time together is such a powerful thing that people should be reminded to do and have, like schedule it. Like you said, hey, we are due. Like, let's put this on the calendar. Like such a powerful self-care, relationship care tool. Um, Michael, kind of switching gears, okay. you are a school counselor, a professional licensed counselor. Talk to me about the journey to that position and your why behind why you wanted to be a counselor. I am passionate about mental health and impacting young people through that. And I would love to hear kind of where, how, where you came from, how you got to that position. Well, um, I'll give you the cliff notes version because <laughs> um, my wife will let she'll let you know oh you can she might elbow me i get kind of long-winded no, um, <laughs> right. the people but, don't want to hear uh, me talk so okay <laughs> 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 because my father was in the air force for 20 years um i'm a military brat so i did lots of traveling and i was one of those children who grew up asking the why question or the how come so i always wanted to know the story behind something i wanted to understand why why were why were things like this i had to get a better understanding so for me to understand it um before i could determine it myself i had to ask the question why why this or why that so i always say i was a kid who grew up and never stopped asking that question so early on um in college um i was kind of like well i wonder why people think the way that they think so that led me to the field of psychology which of course, graduating with an undergrad in experimental psychology gets you no job um, <laughs> in the real world. So, of course, I, I, um, I also had a passion for working with children. So I was able to merge the two. Um, coincidentally, my first job out of undergrad, University of South Carolina, was as a preschool director for La Petite Academy. Okay. Um, imagine that. So I did that for about a year and a half. And after working with the, the parents, working with the kids, I learned early, even before I entered the realm of um, mental health or education, that when you're working with kids, it's never the kids. It's always the adults that will, you know, cause the bigger issues. Um, so after working there, I learned that, okay, clearly I have a passion for this and I really want to, I need to go back to school so I can do what I want to do, which is help children. Mm -hmm. Like, I want to be able to help them on a bigger scale. So I went back to school. I went to Clark Atlanta University, um, which is in Atlanta. And while there, I always refer to my experience at Clark Atlanta University, uh, which is a HBCU, um, as one of the, the pivotal moments in my, I would say, in my career. And that was so early on because I feel like I learned more in two years at Clark Atlanta than I did at four years in the University of South Carolina. And that's primarily because of the mentorship I felt like I got from my professors. I kind of, I feel like they kind of pulled me behind the curtain for me to see, okay, yes, Michael, we understand that you want to help children. We get it. We understand that you want to be a therapist. We get it. We understand it. 
but how else can you leverage your expertise? What else can you do? What else do you have passion for? Because there are other avenues and a you know a certain niche, niche that you may have that others may not. Mm-hmm. So I was able to understand that um, in my twenties as a black male therapist, I felt like okay, there are a lot of different avenues that I can walk into, and it may be you know I may I may be a unique fit mm-hmm. um, based upon the population that is you know that that needs services. Mm-hmm. Right. So that led me to community mental health which in turn, after years of working with community mental health, um, Department of Fam- Family and Children Services, Department of Juvenile Justice, community mental health, I served as a community mental health director, mm-hmm. um, just all the different facets that you can think of, including long-term psychiatric treatment facilities. Wow. Um, so doing all of that led me to education, which I think I was destined from the start. It's just a um, true story when it came down to determining which track I was going to go down um, or complete in my um, graduate schooling, Mm -hmm. it was between community mental health and it was school counseling. And I chose community mental health because (laughs) it took less time because I knew I could get an internship during the summertime, whereas the school counselors could not because school was out. So I was like, gotcha. uh, I'm going to go with that. I'm going with A, Alex. I'm choosing that one. <laughs> um, so I always say, I feel like I was I, where I am now is where I was supposed to be, but I wouldn't change the process or the path in which led me to where I'm at now because mm-hmm. I brought, I bring a lot of experience to my right. position. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, um, sorry, <clears throat> hearing that story, do you feel that being in education and your elementary education currently, correct? Yes. So do you feel like it's more of a proactive approach? Like you're getting in early, you're making that yeah. impact so that they don't necessarily need so much in the community afterwards. Like you are at the forefront, the first line of defense. Is that is that kind of the connection that you made? That is the exact connection that I made because I felt like it was more of an intervention. If I can catch them early, yep. then by the time they get to middle school and high school, uh, the, the, the thought or the rationale behind it is, hopefully I will have made an impact and started planting some seeds Mm -hmm. that can start growing in middle school and high school. Because if not, then what happens is it's more like, um, there, there are systems out there that are much more punitive. Um, and it becomes punitive for people who need mental health issues when they should receive, when they should be receiving mental health issues, they're receiving, you know, punitive Punitive legal issues. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, you were right on that one. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. And when I, I was listening to a previous podcast that we were on and I heard you're on elementary, like I think back to even any of my schooling and I didn't have, I don't remember having a school counselor, a legitimate mental health counselor or any discussion. And I grew up in the Georgia education system, as you guys uh, <laughs> just heard, but it was that guidance counselor, right? And you guys spoke on yes. this right. in that previous mm-hmm. podcast. So just real quick, I'm, people probably know more than me, but this is just a selfish question. Like talk to me about the major issues that you address at the elementary level mm-hmm. as a mental health counselor. Mm-hmm. Well, at the elementary level, the issues that a lot of our teenagers are having now is the things move in, in, in cycles in the sense of when we say, this generation is much more advanced than what we were when we were their age, it follows down the line. So if we're, if they're more advanced than we were, then just know that those elementary school kids now will be much more advanced than they are. Correct. So those issues that they're facing now, Mm -hmm. when you're talking about, and then with the advent of social media, my goodness, it's, it's, it's unprecedented. I know that word has been used like so much during the course of 2020, <laughs> but it's unreal how much access they have mm-hmm. to things that they should not have access to. I'm talking about in first grade. Um, right. So a lot of the issues that I see now mimic those that you see at the middle school and high school level when you're talking about um, peer pressure, um, friend, uh, like any type of friend drama any type of uh, social media things, bullying, mm-hmm. cyber bullying, um, all those things that happen. And mm-hmm. even some, you know, some, some issues of um, aggression or confront, confrontational issues, right. those things seem to happen. And with me being um, 
uh, fourth and I primarily work with fourth and fifth grade. Okay. My co-counselors, we always say we work with every student in the building because we, we're a cohesive team. So it doesn't matter if it's a kindergartner mm -hmm. or a first grader. Um, if I already know them and have a rapport with them, I'll just go to them mm -hmm. first and then I'll come back behind and then let the, you know, the grade level counselor for that, for that student know that I met with them. Right. But um, I've even had, I had a first grader one year who had, um, he had a cell phone. He was first grade cell phone was ringing, you know, during class, like, <laughs> what do <are> you, <laughs> and it was his mom leaving him a message to let him know that um, he's going to need to let the dog out when he got home. Therefore, letting you know that he's going home by himself, oh, right? which is a major issue. So, I mean, things like that seem that, you know, tend to happen more often than not now. And it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's unfortunate, but it is where we are now as a society. Yeah, it's, it's something I've thought a lot about uh, my background in the education space is running an after school program at the middle school level. And something that I noticed early on from students that I would bring to the gym and students in the program was that where when I think when we were students and, you know, got picked on or there was drama at school, when I got off the bus, it was pretty much over. Like it stopped yeah. because I was home, kind of my safe area. Maybe that if it was with a neighbor, maybe that's a problem, but we'll figure that out in the neighborhood. But really there wasn't like late night texting and social media bullying, right. and all those things. Right. Like I didn't, but right now it's like, it never stops. And like, yes. it's just something I thought yeah. about a lot. So I, I love hearing like that, that we're addressing those things super young. Um, yes. I want to switch gears a little bit to Nita and talk about you are a coach and you've mm -hmm. come from being a teacher to now a coach. What was your why in that transition from being at the ground level to now mentoring and coaching other educators? Um, okay. So I was, in, I was te a teacher for 13 years in the classroom, um, all elementary. And it's interesting because people always ask me, you know, what made you want to become a coach? And it kind of just fell on my lap. It was kind of one of those <laughs> things that... I always tell people that if you're going to transition, I don't think it's a good thing to transition when you're like burnout because you still want to have that joy about what you do. Like, so I actually transitioned when I was like, it was like one of my favorite years teaching. I was teaching first grade. Right. Um, this position kind of fell in my lap and I was like, Ooh, it was really a chat, like, you know, challenging one for me. Like I came home to discuss it with Mike and I was like, Oh, like I love teaching, but this is an awesome opportunity to help teachers and, and to like, um, expand more, like to help more teachers expand, you know, help more kids in the process, um, and what I'm doing. And so that's kind of how it happened. It kind of just, it really just fell yeah. in my lap. Yeah. Um, and it's funny cause I thought I wanted to be an administrator, and that was kind of like where I was kind of thinking I track and this fell in my lap. I was like, Oh, this sounds so great. This is like the best. And so um, I had to make a hard decision um, to leave the classroom. And even now there's sometimes when I go into classrooms and I'm like, Oh, I miss teaching so badly. Um, but I think that's why you should, if you're thinking about leaving the classroom and like doing something different, higher level to not wait until you're burnt out. Like, don't Absolutely. like, don't wait until you're burnt out. Cause then you have like a, um, the attitude and the mindset is different. Um, and so that's what happened. It just literally just fell in my lap to become a coach. It yeah. really did. Taking an opportunity is much different than looking for a way out. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So reading through, I, I can like see your passion and your excitement and your smile okay. as you're talking about this. Those of you that are lis listening to this, you're not gonna be able to see that, but I can see it. So trust <laughs> me. Um, and then I was going through your social media and I saw a, quote from a parent talking about they were concerned about their children's reading over the summer and you scheduled appointments and you were reading to their child and they ended up going I think it was first grade or second grade the next year yeah. and they were just like top of the class of reading like yeah. I just see that as above and beyond what I see from a lot of other educators on social media like hey the day ends or the school year ends and it's like yeah. see ya like, where do you find, <laughs> yeah. where do you find, I'm out. <laughs> yeah. Peace. Right. Yeah. Like, I, I believe my contract ended a week ago. Like I'm done. I know. <laughs> so where, where do you find the energy and the enthusiasm? I mean, you could have spent that time with Michael or with your own kids, but you, you took that extra step to make that impact. And I can see that you're making the impact on staff and students. Like, where does that come from? Is it like you had a teacher back never. in the day? 
Like, it's so crazy. It never stops. Like Mike will be like, because I'm so passionate yeah. about what I do. Mm-hmm. It never, like, it just never stops. And so like when that happened, I was going, um, I was already working with my own child. And so I was like, okay, I'm working with Eva. She's sick. It's like, why don't we just do this? Why don't we just, you get your child on zoom. I'll have a zoom on for Eva. She'll go in another room and we'll zoom together. Like we'll just yep. do a zoom and I'll do a, um, a guided reading lesson and we'll work through that or whatever. Um, and it kind of just, one of those things I was like, well, that's not going to happen. We're not going to let him fall through the cracks. We're going to work together and do this. Um, and so it's just really, I'm just really passionate. And I think I just always have been passionate about what I do. And I mm-hmm. always tell people like, I'm a coach, but I'm always at the heart, a teacher. Like I'm yeah. always a teacher. I'm always putting myself um, like in the minds of my teachers in my, in the room, like when it's too much, like I, I try to go to my admin and be like, Hey, it's a lot. It's a lot. Like if yeah. I was them right now, I would be feeling this way. You know what I mean? Um, and not that I have the voice for all of them and that, um, the way I feel is how they feel, but I try to put myself in their shoes every day. Um, and so, but I am passionate about it. I mean, Mike will tell you, like, I get books all the time. I'm always reading. I'm always listening to podcasts. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm just always trying to learn more and think of new ideas for the teachers. And um, like, it's so funny because I tell a teacher one time, I was like, oh, can you, when you do this, can I come in and just see? Can I just <laughs> watch you do it? Because I love teaching so much. Yeah. Um, and it really is not a farce. Like, I just, I just, I've always been passionate about it. And I still, I read up on it all the time. Um you know, follow people on Instagram and get new ideas and things like that. Yeah. I love it. And it's so inspirational for someone who isn't an, not an educator directly, Mm -hmm. but seeing that and knowing that Mm -hmm. you're impacting teachers and therefore that just like waterfalls down into so many more students through that impact. And I love people like yourself, both of you who, you know, continue to take a step up the rung to get to those leadership positions that allow you to impact more and more and more people through your work. So that's great. Uh, I want to read another or a quote from Mike, your, your I believe it's your Instagram um, about insecurities and then ask you a question about the quote. So it's on the journey of life, there will be people that have their own insecurities that they're working through. Their insecurities should not stop you from shining. Don't dim your light because those in the dark can't find their way. Love the quote. Boom. Right. (laughs) Share that one. Retweet that one. Yeah. Um, (laughs) I want to hear what that quote means to you and why you put it out there. And then I've got a follow on question for both of you. Well, for me, I I say because sometimes we have a tendency when people may feel. I'm not going to say less than, but when they kind of like position themselves to kind of close themselves off to you. Um, sometimes we have a tendency as people to react to that because and maybe I'll give you an example. So we walk down the hallway and someone doesn't speak. This happens in schools in any school, any town, mm-hmm. USA. Yep. So we speak to, to our colleague and maybe they just didn't speak because maybe they didn't hear you. Maybe they, you know, were preoccupied with their own mm-hmm. thoughts or it could be maybe they just don't like you. I mean, that's the reality of it. That can happen too. It's mm-hmm. high stress. Right. You know, people have other things going on. Um, but just because that happens does not mean now because you've experienced that, that you change up who you are as a person. Mm-hmm. So now you don't allow that to, to change your game plan. You still move forward the way that you move forward in life. Mm-hmm. Because when you stop doing that, those that are looking, that are looking to you for inspiration, those who you know, admire, happen to admire you from afar, when you stop doing that, what are they looking to next? Mm-hmm. Right. Like you may be the light for them that day that keeps them focused and pushing forward. You might be the motivation for them. So the day that you're off, the day that you decide, you know what, I'm going to change up and, you know, be a little different today, or I'm going to, you know what, because they treated me this way, I'm going to treat other people this way. Now you've ruined it for other people who may be looking and inspiring you know, maybe inspired by you. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I think that's, I was hoping you would go that route, like being an inspiration, <laughs> hopefully bringing that person up to your level, as opposed to yeah. like lowering yourself to whatever they're experiencing, or maybe they're just feeling a little down, but it's such a powerful message, especially mm-hmm. today, election day, you know, and everything going on that like, you never know, especially in the school environment, who's yeah. looking to you 
whether yes. it be a peer or a student, or maybe even someone that's above you for right. you to set that example. And I think yeah. when people allow themselves to kind of fall into the rut, just because that's the climate of the day or the climate of a peer, you know, it, it, they're missing out on an opportunity. Um, and I love that. And in the spirit of this being, you know, the humans of education podcast and to show that you two are human. Yeah. Nita, I will start with you. Talk to me about an insecurity that you feel um, as an educator, as a coach, as a parent that you're continuing to address and work on that maybe someone else can relate to and understand like, hey, we're all in this together. Um, for me, I guess this year has been a challenging year for me just as a coach and trying to find my space. Um, and because I used to be very, just more visible than I can be because of COVID um, and just the safety precautions that we're trying to take. Um, and for me as a coach, I feel like I haven't been able to be on my game as much as I usually am um, because like I'm used, I'm used to being in, in the classrooms and doing all these lessons and modeling for teachers. And that just can't happen with COVID because um, right. we're trying to stay in our little bubbles. And so for me, I think the insecurity I've been having is me not being as effective as I once was. And so, and I feel like a lot of teachers may be feeling that, especially um, being digital, being hybrid, being um, brick and mortar, or sometimes some teachers are doing this digital uh, and doing it all. together yeah. at the same time. Yeah. And you just, I just feel like, you know, you just have to give yourself grace. I mean, this is just a hard time. Um, and I think, I feel like for me, it's easier for me to like say to someone else, give themselves, give yourself grace, you know, just for myself. It's like, <laughs> yes. I, yes. it's like Michael told me all the time, you're, you're a perfectionist, Nita. I'm yeah. like, no, I'm not. He's like, yes, you are like, let it go. Mm. And so I have a hard time <laughs> letting it go. Like yep. just being like, okay, this is, I've did my best that I can do. And now I have to let it go because I'm always trying to like find a way to go around it. Like, okay, well I can do it, but you know, this way. And Mike's like, just, just go to bed, just let it go. <laughs> and I think that's, that is my issue. Like that is the part that I'm really trying to just relax and just know that um, like God has it and that I have to just do the best that I can do. And that is good enough. Like yeah, that is good. Enough. That is so relatable. I think to everyone, just like you pointed out, like the hardest person you know, it's, it's so hard to take your own advice, right? You yeah. know, coming from the coach space or, you know, like me, the health and fitness space, I can talk health and fitness and nutrition every day, but mm -hmm. it's often hard to do it. Your, it's even harder to do it yourself. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You, have to, yeah. you have to find a coach to coach you, even though you're the professional. Um, yeah. So I think that's, that's beautiful. And having compassion for yourself is mm -hmm. such an art and difficult skill to master. I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, and Mike, what about you? Um. <laughs> Mine has been organization. Um, and I say organization because last year, this is this is my third year as a school counselor. It's like, I almost feel like it feels like the third year, but then the way last year ended, it's almost like a cliffhanger. Like it didn't really right. fully end. So mm -hmm. uh, maybe 2.5, but, <laughs> but this is <laughs> my third year. And last year I really felt more on top of it as far as organization like I was on top of things I had stuff filed I had stuff mm -hmm. situated I had everything in in its place this year I feel like my desk is like oh wait a minute guys it's, I think it's let me let me let me find sift through all this it's right there because things continue to change in my district <laughs> um it's like it's a policy for this and then it becomes a policy for that but nonetheless, um, I don't want to bore you guys with those details, <laughs> but organization has been um, a struggle for me this year. And it's something that I'm trying to, you know, stay on top of. But it's it's I'm a work in progress. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a work in progress. We, we all are. I appreciate you guys yeah. being open and vulnerable and sharing those things. I think it's so valuable to hear you know, people look up to you guys on social media or in, in your own environments. And I think it's powerful people to hear, you know, we're all on the same playing field and we all have ups and downs and all those things. So yeah. I appreciate that. A couple of questions to finish that I ask every guest on this new format. I'll start with you, Mike. If students, or sorry, if there's one class that every student around the world should have in education that's not currently taught, what would it be? 
Oh, man. Um, I, I love that you're a counselor. This, this is a different perspective. I think this would be good. Uh, I'm trying to think of one aside from the one that first comes to mind. Mm -hmm. Empathy. Empathy love is it. one that mm -hmm. I say it because we all think that we have it until we're in a situation that where we can't express it. Mm -hmm. We can't show it. Like right now is a prime example. Like empathy is, well, I say right now because it's election night. Mm -hmm. right. Clearly there's going to be a winner. Well, we don't know. I, we don't know. We don't know when there's going to be a winner <laughs> or a loser, but at, at some, some point, point we hope. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so at some point that hopefully foreseeable future, um, <laughs> it will happen. But um, just the whole idea of empathy, I almost feel like as a nation, we kind of took the, we kind of entered, climbed down into the rabbit hole of what it looks like when there is no empathy. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's been very chaotic and very brutal. Mm -hmm. And it's even, you know, entered into the school buildings more so probably now than years past. Mm -hmm. And I feel like while everyone may feel like they understand, oh yeah, I understand, I identify with their feelings, but it's a little bit deeper than that. Just the whole idea of what empathy truly means, what mm -hmm. that looks like and how you demonstrate that, mm -hmm. I think would be great for all students to uh, on all at all levels mm -hmm. to for it to be a mandatory class because with the advent, like I keep going back to the advent of social media, it's a 24 hour news cycle for us, but it's a 24 hour yeah. social media cycle for them. Right. So like you said, when they go to sleep, it, the, the memes are still coming. They wake up in the morning, it's still coming. Yeah. It's still another joke. It's still like, uh, you know, mm -hmm. it's like a bad dream that they can't get out of. So I think if we all demonstrate and, and really, you know, help them to understand the importance of empathy, some of those things would change and they'd be much more well-adjusted as, as young adults. Yeah. I love, I love that answer. I think, you know, empathy is absent, like you talked about in a lot of areas currently. And a lot of times when people want to lean or say they have empathy, it's, they lean towards the same view that they have like, Oh yeah, I'm empathetic to that. Like, but it's yeah. the same exact view right. that possibly they already have. So <laughs> right, right. I mean, like, right. Oh no, I got I'm empathetic. And they're like, well, yeah. that's not exactly what right. we're looking for. Not what yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so I love that. And having that in education, I think would be powerful. I love that answer. Um, Nita, if you were to give a TED talk this weekend, what would the topic be and the title? This weekend. <laughs> um, Come on, babe. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness. Just um, probably remembering your why. Um, and I think that as educators, we forget that a lot um, of why we got into this thing, why we're doing what we're doing. Um, I think you, it can get bogged down with a lot of different things. You can get a new admin or a new principal and it can help you to not remember because you're focused on little things <laughs> or, you know, just changes. Um, I, I tell everyone that I, my, my cheese has gotten moved so many times this year that I've been really struggling with my cheese being moved. I told that, I mean, I said that to my admin. So I was like, you know, I my cheese being moved. I'm struggling. Um, but I think just remembering your why I have it on my wall, um, in my, in my space at my school for a reason. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's for the teachers, but it's for me too. Like it's, it's definitely for me too, to remember why I became a coach. And I remember, um, the first day first couple of days I became a coach, I called Mike and I was like, I don't know if I made the right choice. <laughs> like, I don't have any kids coming to my classroom. They don't even know me. Like, you know, I'm not high-fiving any kids. Like, it sucks. Um, but I love what I do now. Um, and I just have to remember my why. And there's some good days and bad days. Yep. Um, and that would definitely be my TED Talk about just remembering your why and how to do that. Yeah, I love it. Um, there's so much talk about it. Everyone, you know, Simon Sinek obviously has a, a brilliant book about it. And there's like, everyone talks about finding your why, but I think revisiting that why on a oh regular basis is so powerful. So I love that you have it up as I well. So you can too. see it. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, and then final question for the both of you, you guys are obviously a power couple in education. When your work is done as that power couple in education, what does the world or the world of education look like when your work is done? Not saying that it ever will be, but if you, if it were to be complete, what would it look like? 
Mm. That's a good one. What a good question. I'll let you go first. Um, or if you need more time. Yeah, go ahead. You already have. You know, you're already ready. Ever, yeah, you're ready. You're like ready. <laughs> just ready to jump, pounce, no thought. Um, Let's go. I look at it like it's a much more liberating environment mm. um, by the time we're we're done. And I know um, while we're not experts in, you know, anti-racism, we're not experts in that. Um, I always say that even when you're attempting to be, you're going to get it wrong because everyone makes mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, but I say it in, in a way to where just people being able to be their true authentic self mm -hmm. um, without any recourse and, and when, I'm, uh, when I say true authentic self, I'm not saying like, okay, if you're an axe murderer, be an axe murderer. <laughs> right. But um, in the field of education, as an educator, you're allowed to be who you are. You're allowed to bring who you are to work, to, uh, to um, positively impact your students mm -hmm. and your, your environment. Yeah. Um, that would be what I would want it to look more like because I, I feel like in some schools, there are educators who put on a mask every day to go to work. And then when they leave work, they take the mask off and they're a totally different person. Mm -hmm. right. You're like, whoa, I didn't even know that you, wow, I mm -hmm. had no clue. Like had I known that, then, you know, we could have collaborated on a few more things. But, so that's my vision of what I would want it to look like one, once I left. And the piggyback off of Mike, like I, we all, <clears throat> me and him always talk about like how important it is to build relationships. Like yes. that is like, so key um, in what we do as educators. And I think sometimes we miss, t educators miss the mark mm -hmm. sometimes. And I think it's because we have so much other things on our plates that we're just trying to check boxes off. And we forget that, that the relationship piece is huge. Yes. Um, and so, you know, us leaving our mark is like making sure that whoever we touch that we've we've actually had a really authentic relationship with that last, you know, ongoing and that the, what we've shown people will carry on through other people. And so I, I really think that's a huge issue because we always talk about relationships. Like that is the foundation, right. um, whether it's, you know, um, teacher to student or anyone in your building, like relationships matter. And yeah. so I think that's, I think that's another too. A hundred percent. I love those answers, guys. This has been so much fun. We've been going for, I think, 50 minutes. Uh, I yeah, told you an hour was going to be plenty, but we just kept going. It was great. Um, <laughs> I, really, I really appreciate you guys being on the show. I know you're busy, um, but I think so many people are going to benefit from this. So I just thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you thank for you. having we us. really appreciate yeah, it, man. Absolutely. Yeah. Guys, I appreciate you listening to the show. Uh, please give us a five-star review. Comment wherever you see this on social media. Let Michael and Nita know what you think. Make sure you follow them. All of their social media handles will be in the show notes. Have a great rest of your day.